For me, I think the real uh, turning point was maybe when I was 11 or so. I lived in New Jersey and I didn't know that many other people who were into the things that I was into. And suddenly I was able to meet other kids and talk to them about music and politics and sort of form our identities together. And I don't think I even knew at the time how this is not a thing that was possible at any point in history before. I was at a friend's place and he showed me the, the modem went with its shopping. <laughs> Characteristic sound. And instead of just connecting to a computer, he was connected to a gateway computer, giving him the possibility to access other computers. This just blew my mind. The simple fact that they could have, you know, um, forums or block discussions with people across the world, they thought that it was really magic. I think what you're seeing now is both, you know, different levels, both from the governments and the companies, but also from the individual users, a growing awareness that, you know, there may be, it may be not such a free space after all. Intelligence confirms it's collecting the private messages of internet users. Nine major internet companies, they include uh, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Microsoft, Skype, YouTube, Apple, AOL, and PalTalk, have been used by the FBI and the National Security Agency to monitor photos, videos, emails, audio, and all other sorts of information tracking a sweeping scope of individuals' online activity. After the first dot-com bust, um, some of the internet companies then who you know, there been this promise that the internet would be the kind of new economy, and they had thought that people subscribing to services um, would actually be the way they would make money. But as as we found out, you know, nobody was willing to do that, and people really wanted to visit websites and have services online for free. After that, um, a couple of organisations started experimenting with the idea of using the data that they had on their users and realizing this was quite valuable in, in the context of advertising. And that's kind of how it started. It's what some people call the Internet's original sin. When 9-11 uh, happened, they took the programs that uh, uh, I had helped do and put together and used them to spy on everybody in the planet, including all U.S. citizens first. We were the first ones who uh, they, they, they adopted bulk acquisition and bulk collection on. That was U.S. citizens. They do it in the easiest way they can, which means if companies have assembled information about uh, their customers, then that's a readily accessible set of information about a large number of people. Uh, then the intelligence agencies will simply go there and buy it from that company or get access to, to their data directly. It's a kind of surveillance that is rather invisible to the person and that is at the crossroads of public and private actors. And, and that is nested in our everyday life through our everyday services, you see? So it's much more, I would say, difficult for the people to identify that they are object of surveillance. Putting yourself, tons of personal information online using Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, uh, people don't really realize the danger when it comes to that. Uh, but people, have instant benefits. It's immediate. It's granted to me, and it's free. So it's easy. Uh, and it's very difficult to balance something that is free, easy, enjoyable, with something that might be dangerous in a hard-to-predict future. Ooh, <laughs> Oh, 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 
Zwei schönen, schöne um, äh, Tracks. Halbe sieben im Keller. Fuck, wenn ich spiel dir. Na, rede. Ähm, Gordon hat, weil der hat Regie gemacht hat in Leipzig. Wie man da vorgeht, weil die haben irgendwie nicht mehr viel Geld über und schon und dabei haben. Und das wird wahrscheinlich in diese Vertragssache. Jo. Nee, das ist super. Jo, bis bald. Ciao. Without a doubt, the most, um, I'd say, aggressive data collector is, is through the mobile phone because we're taking it with us in the things that we do. And when this acts kind of like a tracking device, we're leaving data traces um, that not only indicate things like services that we're accessing, but also where we're going, what our behaviors and patterns are. Um, what you can see very quickly is things like, you know, when does that person often go to bed? Uh, are they traveling? Do they call their, if they're traveling, do they call a partner every morning? Do they call them in the evening? Did they go out for dinner? You know, who are they talking to? Who are their social, the, the social graph is called, meaning the people, the circle of people around them. And so there are different ways that people are then profiled or categorized on the basis of their behaviors. Another thing that's happening is that people, again, through their social media um, use are being profiled in terms of their maybe their political affiliations, their religion, their sexual orientation, these kinds of things. There's the companies that were perhaps not surprised are collecting our data. So for example, you know, the news website we go to, or maybe the use of Google, that kind of thing. But then there's the companies that are tracking our data that we don't see, that we don't kind of choose. So for example, when we're looking at website for the news, there'll be lots of other what are called third party trackers. Those third party are present, some of them, are present nearly 100% of your navigation. This means that some company that you have not actually endorsed to be present in your navigation, you have not choosed actively, they are still looking what are you doing. And uh, that is present uh, on um, entertainment, uh, pornography, healthcare, uh, news. This is what some people call the data brokering industry. Some of the most, um, I'd say, growth, the growth areas there are things like uh, online dating or websites discussing health issues, for example. The business model for the people who are providing the site is to collect your data and often sell it on, for example, in the case of health sites, to pharmaceutical companies. So what's... What is she doing? Is she fine? Let's, let's... Yeah, yeah she's fine. So we can check as can we posted a picture of five minutes ago. And right now, too. Yeah. And very... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really funny. I'm always sending nice ones and then she's answering the ugly ones. I said, that's nice, Kim said, no, this is nice. Is that, is that like emojis that you have to buy? No, you just um, download. download. Yeah. Yeah. But why did Wood connect my camera? But it's not about this, it's just the possibility that they if you yeah. want to bear you, they can yeah. do it. Like well, but this, 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 is, this is technol technology. <laughs> this is yeah. technology. But I you feel like that's why I don't care, you know, because I think, okay, no one wants to know what I'm doing anyway. I mean, like, but I think it's really more. interesting that everyone says I don't have anything to hide. Like I have something to hide because I do stuff which is against the law, and I think we all do in a way. Yeah. 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 I think it's kind of a f um, difficult question, the, the, the process people go to, through in, I think, justifying their use of technology in terms of this business model of, you know, okay, I get this for free, I give over my data and I have nothing to hide, so why do I care? And maybe it's a bit creepy, maybe it's a bit strange, maybe I get certain adverts sent to me, but it doesn't make any difference to me. And I think that means that for people like us who try to argue something different, that we should care about these things, it's quite hard to break that barrier. Part of the reason I think this is that how quickly people are ready to volunteer that, it makes me a little suspicious, you know, that they're like, no, no, I have nothing to hide, clearly. And really they're thinking, maybe I'm a little worried about this, but I don't, I don't want to be the one to say it. Think about how people 
who care about surveillance have been marginalized, you know? There are so many jokes about wearing the tinfoil hat and, you know, you, do you really believe that they're reading your emails? When I hear someone say that, I actually hear them say, I believe something quite different from this, but I don't want you to know that I do because I don't want to be the one who thinks that. And, and near, the, near the problem with the nothing to fear, nothing to hide debate is that all of us do have something to hide. You know, every, every single adult has probably committed a criminal offence in their life. It might be something quite minor, like stealing from work um, or, or traffic violations, but there are many activities that are criminal but not necessarily deviant. You know, the criminological literature will tell you that a lot of people offend consistently, you know, and it's in, you know, the, the percentage of like 60% more or more people will regularly commit offences. These might be minor offences. So, so lots of us um, have, have something to hide in, in that respect. If you say you have nothing to fear because you have nothing to hide, so be happy, not worry, I say, okay, fine, turn over the keys to your car, your house, all of your passwords, all of your accounts, medical records, everything. And I'll put them into a special secure lockbox, but I'm gonna keep it, I will keep it for safekeeping. No one, and I've, I've this is now thousands of people uh, over the last several years in front of m multiple audiences. No one was willing to turn over any of that information to me. And I'm asking them to consent. <laughs> okay, tell me. <laughs> so basically what we would do is put a spy uh, software on your, on your cell phone, which is gonna look at the, the patterns and actually at the things you agree or click okay on the terms of condition of the apps you're using. Yeah. This plus your browser, we would mostly look uh, not really into the contents, but on what we call uh, metadata, where you're going, when do you browse, to whom do you talk, and basically look a little bit like, what does your digital life say about you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um. Is it, is it like my computer and my cell phone? Yes. Tracked? Yes. Okay. You know a bit who I, like how I am and I don't really give a shit. <laughs> so, because that's what I always think, what, what, what everyone tells you that I still think that I have not that much to hide, but you know. <laughs> We'll see, maybe. <laughs> in a few years, there will be some serious drawbacks coming. For example, if you take the insurance industry, um, Facebook just released an algorithm that is able to give you some rating, some, some sort of credit, credit rating, which is kind of weird when you think about it, but totally normal in terms of big data. Uh, Facebook is totally able to predict if you will pay back your loan or not. There's usually a point at which people do care. And I think that's the question of what do they care about? So do they care because um, they don't, they know that the tax inspector is now using these technologies to track people? Do they care because um, they've got um, a family member who has a history of mental health issues? Do they care because they themselves don't want to be um, given a different you know, deal in terms of you know, now very high life uh, health insurance costs because of their lifestyle, this kind of thing. Credit rating is totally predictable. It will happen. In a few years, your personal information, the one you're willingly putting online, on Facebook, Twitter, all this thing, will give you credit rating. And if you end up with a bad credit rating, well, you ask for it. You are the one thinking that you had nothing to hide. I like to speak about intimacy. And if fundamental rights seem like something remote, something you may not want to care about because, you know, you have to fill your fridge, you have to pay the rent, you have to, to wipe the, the baby's ass and, and, and whatnot, uh, then an intimacy is not what you're willing to give up. You understand what it means. Intimacy is those spaces where you are truly yourself, either alone or with people you decide to share this intimacy. With. Intimacy is when you're, you're naked, either as a metaphor or, or really. It's when you can experiment with yourself, you can experiment with, with new ideas, with new concepts, with new practices, 
without being judged by your peers. If you're in the middle of a crowd of 100 people and take a guitar and think, ah, oh, what would it do if I played like this, cling, clong, clong? You would never do it. If you're alone in your bedroom with that guitar, you do the cling, clang, clong, and, and maybe it, it sounds like shit. And you try again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And maybe after 1,000 times, you'll feel ready to have another person listen to it. And maybe after 10,000 times, you'll feel ready to have 100 people listen to it. Der andere soll einen einfach mal wollen. Aber von sich aus soll der wollen. Ja, von sich aus soll der das wollen. Aber so wie ich das will. It's because you have an opportunity in your ETMAC to experiment without being judged. That you can make mistakes with no cost. It's because of that that you can develop your personality. This is what, what, what we are being robbed. People don't really think of these things. I think also they don't realize that their situation may someday change. You know, today you might feel like you're not a very political person or your life is not very exciting. Um, but what happens if suddenly, you know, uh, let's say you live in a rural part of the world and an oil company wants to put a pipeline through your land or something that now suddenly you do have some things to hide. You do have an adversary. Arguing that you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying that you don't care about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. But the bottom line here is even if you're not using a given right at this precise moment, other people do. Saying that you don't care about a right because you're not using it personally is the most antisocial thing you can possibly say. What it's saying is that I don't care about other people. Now, particularly if this is being said by someone who occupies a position of privilege, you know, if you're a rich old white guy sitting on the very top of society, you don't care what the laws are, you don't care what the rights are, because society is ordered to protect your interest. It's the minorities who always face the greatest risk. I saw my mom and my grandmother go through some really tough experiences. And I, you know, became aware that Discrimination and violence against women and girls wasn't just happening in my family or community. And I decided that I wanted to work on these issues. Um, and it wouldn't be unusual for a human rights researcher to become a target even of US surveillance. Um, you know, I'm someone who has interviewed not only Somalis and Egyptians, but also Iraqis, Afghanis, uh, Yemenis. Um, so, you know, the people that I interview typically are coming from populations of, of extreme political interest um, to my own country, uh, to the U.S., um, in context even of the war on terror. And I do think that it's, you know, not only plausible but probable that I became a target of U.S. intelligence interest, um, not just because I'm a human rights researcher, but after doing this research with Somali girls and uncovering instances where girls named uh, Americans and Saudis as so-called clients of sex trafficked uh, refugee girls in Djibouti. What we see in different countries around the world is the political situation um, and the, the sort of political agenda changing quickly. So something that's okay now to talk about might not be okay in three years time. If you combine uh, a drastic and very disruptive technological progress and uh, this soon to come uh, political disruption, you will end up in a short time period in something so different that any kind of prospective effort is really, really difficult to make. So I'm gonna plug in the USB stick and we can have a look at what data we have. Mm -hmm. So we have different... Tricks or logs. Exactly. So all logs, that's data from his iPhone. And from the MacBook. And from the MacBook. And from the MacBook, we have his browser history. So from his laptop. 
And from the iPhone, we have lots of different data sources. Ah. So we have GPS data, we have an overview of all the apps he has installed, we have his browser history from his, from his iPhone, we know who he called, who's in his address book, we have his Facebook messages, SMS, Skype messages, WhatsApp messages. Damn. Yeah, so we can... I feel bad. Kind of see what, what apps he used. So I'm a data analyst, which means I work with databases and I analyze data to well, to usually find fraud or suspicions of fraud on the data. And I'm going to apply my skills here to, well, first of all, to identify patterns in the data, to see who my sex is, what he does regularly, but also to find things that are unusual in the data. My goal is to correlate the different data sources, to see whether there are any patterns between the different data sources. I was dedicated to do privacy analysis on the mainstream website. So understand which are the third party trackers present in the website. Uh, I will try to apply this analysis also to the browsing history of Mr. X. The point is it's uh, collecting data on that scale on everybody in a country uh, presents the opportunity for the government to go really bad. Uh, they just don't understand that. Now, people in Germany who have uh, experience with totalitarian states like the Stasi and the Gestapo and SS, they have living memory of what it means to have that kind of information in a central, central uh, repository for central government to use. Um, and it's only a matter of wh whether or not the, the government is favorable to uh, democratic principles or not as to whether or not they become totalitarian or not. Mein Plan war, mit der Demonstration mitzulaufen bis zum Ende, dort wo das Politbüro auf einer Tribüne stand. Auf meinem Transparent stand der Satz, jeder Bürger der DDR hat das Recht, seine Meinung frei und öffentlich zu äußern. Hier an dieser Laterne hatten sie mich eingeholt und haben mich an den Armen gepackt und ich sollte abgeführt werden. Dann haben sie mich aber gepackt und weggeschleift. Hier diesen ganzen Weg habe ich mich schleifen lassen. Der Pelzmantel meiner Mutter war danach hinüber. Und hier stand ein großer Lastwagen, ein äh, ohne Plane, also ein Freier. Und hier bin ich dann äh, kontrolliert worden. Da haben sie dann auch mein Transparent gefunden, was ich im äh, Rucksack noch hatte. Und äh, ja, und dann sollte ich auf den Lastwagen steigen. The Minister of uh, State Security always said, we have to know who is who. That was his uh, always repeated sentence. That's the main question uh, in our work. You know, I spent many, many years listening in on East German communications. And so the, the motto was to know everything. And at NSA, uh, the mantra under Keith Alexander, uh, director of NSA, uh, Keith Alexander, was to collect it all. Well, part of what it means is collect it all to know it all. And if you know it all, then guess what? Who is who? That means who is thinking what? Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this was very important uh, because the Stasi wanted to um, influence people and to stop uh, political activities before they started. Diese Oppositionbewegung der 80er Jahre begann auf, äh, in der Hochzeit des Kalten Krieges, als Atomwaffen in Deutschland stationiert wurden. Also wurde ich dann Mitbegründerin des ersten Friedenskreises der DDR, des Friedenskreises Pankow, gegen die Militarisierung des Lebens in der DDR, gegen die Stationierung von Atomraketen, gegen Militärunterricht in den Schulen. Ich habe ja dann 1982 auch äh, einen der ersten privaten sozusagen Umweltkreise gegründet, der sich immer in meiner Wohnung traf. Und später dann, ab 1984, äh, kamen dann auch Menschenrechtskreise dazu, also Kreise, die die Menschenrechtsverletzungen in der DDR thematisiert haben. I was in the Stasi archives this past year and it's quite something seeing row after row, file after file, thousands upon tens of thousands 
of uh, paper-based, which in itself had been the system for keeping track of all that, the system for indexing had, had gone through several iterations, and they were actually moving, even the Stasi were moving in the 1980s to computer-based systems. Tonbandmitschnitt here. Here is a Tonbandmitschnitt. So sehen die dann aus. Ja? Da äh, ist bei einer Veranstaltung ähm, heimlich ein Tonband mitgelaufen von der Staatssicherheit. Und äh, die Staatssicherheit hat dann dieses äh, Tonband abgehört und hat aufgeschrieben, was äh, ich auf dieser Veranstaltung gesagt habe. Es gab aber auch äh, Abhörprotokolle vom Telefon, weil ich für die Stasi wichtig genug war, meine Anrufe abzuhören. Also das ist hier ein Maßnahmeplan der Staatssicherheit, Plan zur Zersetzung zum OV-Virus. Virus ist der Name meiner Akte. Operativvorgang Virus. Mit dem Ziel, den Einfluss, die Aktivitäten und die Teilnehmerzahlen des Friedenskreises Pankow zurückzudrängen und die führenden Personen des Kriegen Friedenskreises zu verunsichern, werden folgende Maßnahmen der Zersetzung vorzuschlagen. Das ist ungefähr ein Zwanzigstel. Also ich habe zwar ähm, 20 dicke Leitsordner und dann noch ein paar kleinere ähm, Aktenteile, die man irgendwo gefunden hat. Ich hatte ja insgesamt 49 inoffizielle Mitarbeiter, die über mich berichtet haben. Im Laufe der Jahre 49, da war ich ziemlich erstaunt. Und Virus, den Namen finde ich auch interessant, ja, den die Stasi uns gegeben hat oder mir gegeben hat. Ich bin also diejenige, die zur Erkrankung des Systems führt. Fantasie hatten die Jungs schon. Wolfgang Schmidt was looking at the NSA. He's a former uh, lieutenant colonel in the uh, former lieutenant colonel in the East German Stasi. So he was looking at the uh, uh, NSA uh, surveillance program and he said, uh, to us, meaning the Stasi, this would have been a dream come true. In Western democracies, if you're talking Germany of today, or if you're talking the United States of today, it's not a police state, but the mechanisms the instruments of power necessary to affect that are essentially all in place. The only difference really is the, those in power. And you then have to trust and depend on your leaders to be uh, you know, focused on more democratic ways of life and supporting that. And you can't guarantee that. I mean, no one can. So in the United States, they say it can't happen here. Well, I'm sorry, yes, it can. Seems that he never sleeps. Wait, so because we have data points like every few minutes, all night for two days in a row. Maybe that's his lifestyle, but... <laughs> Here, for example, last data point is at midnight, and then we have another one at 11 in the morning. So that would make sense. So maybe it was really just that he didn't sleep for two days in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and then as I recovered with 11 and a half hours of sleep. <laughs> French MPs have approved a bill which would give intelligence services their most intrusive domestic spying abilities ever with little judicial oversight. The move comes in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo attacks in January. 
This bill will govern all of the powers available to law enforcement, the security and intelligence agencies and the armed forces to acquire the content of communications or communications data. This is a good day for the Sicherheit und die Freiheit der Bürgerinnen und Bürger Deutschlands. Es ist ein schlechter Tag für die großen Verbrecher aller Art. The net effect is if you are a law-abiding citizen of this country, going about your business and your personal life, you have nothing to fear. There are many narratives. One is the nothing to fear, nothing to hide argument. The other one that's commonly articulated is that there is a balance between security and liberty, or sometimes that's more narrowly defined as a balance between security and privacy. It's an extremely problematic um, way of conceptualising these things for several reasons. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said something along the lines that people who are willing to give up their liberty for security will lose both and they deserve neither. And what I take from that is that there's not a simple balancing. These aren't things you can easily quantify and measure against each other. I would say very simply, uh, bulk surveillance has been a direct and absolute continuing failure. I mean, it has stopped. They, they justified by the terrorist groups and stopping terrorism as the means of doing it, the reason why they have to do it. But in fact, it has failed in every turn. Every attack has happened, and they've not been able to stop it by bulk collection. Each time you have a, a terrorist attack somewhere in the world, you hear right after, oh, see, we need more security. We need more security and law. We need more power to the uh, government agencies and the such. It's more than 20 years I am in data protection, but I still am a member of the judiciary with a background on organized crime, anti-mafia legislation, and it was me drafting the so-called Italian uh, Patriot Act. So no need to persuade me that at certain stages uh, interferences are essential and even invasive activities by the state. The deficiency of uh, criminal investigation by police and, and judicial offices should build on uh, selective sources. What works is difficult, is infiltrating the networks, is surveilling the individuals, is blending into the mass, is for agents to learn uh, languages and risk their lives. And the agents don't want that. They got those big computer systems where they can watch the whole world. Well, guess what? It doesn't prevent terrorism. That's true in Paris, that's true in Copenhagen, that's true in London, that's true in uh, New York and um, in Boston and Texas and California. All those attacks, they've never been stopped, yet the people they knew uh, that did it, knew, they knew about them and knew they were, they were potential uh, terrorists. Uh, but they didn't do anything about it, and the reason is because of this bulk acquisition. They have to wade through all this bulk data to try to assess them and what they're doing as a threat. That means the consequence of that is people have to die first. Then you go look at the people who did that and then you focus on them and then you go after anybody who was associated with them. A focused, targeted approach will give them the opportunity to stop people from dying. That's what they need to do. that we got show an enormous depth and breadth to the level of surveillance against the Occupy movement. The FBI is using domestic terrorism authority to go after the Occupy movement and collect information on people and on a movement that they acknowledge throughout the materials is a peaceful, nonviolent movement. Anybody and anybody associated with them were, were surveilled, which meant they had carte blanche for, treat them as a threat and simply uh, in league with the government and others to find every, out everything there was to know about them. Remember, Occupy Wall Street, interestingly enough, did end up resulting. People were on the streets facing police. Right? Meanwhile, there's all the hidden side of that. And with, the, you know, with cameras that can now do facial detection from many uh, hundreds of meters away, scanning crowds, right? and 
incorporating that all into databases just based on a few select points. Tu regardes par exemple, là où j'ai vraiment toute confiance de la filature, c'est juste là, avant le panneau. Là. Donc il y avait le type avec sa capuche. Déjà, bon, il y a des moments où les capuches, la capuche, l'air comme ça, avec le sac à dos, qui regarde obstinément ailleurs quand on le regarde. Et au moment où j'ai fait demi-tour, il s'est passionné d'un coup pour l'interphone de l'immeuble, en regardant si ce n'était pas l'adresse là, Enfin, c'était euh, assez maladroit, assez mauvais. Il y avait aussi une, euh, une femme qui me suivait. Donc là, c'était la... derrière, là, dans le pâté de maison. Il y avait aussi une femme qui me suivait sur la rue euh, transversale, là, ici. Euh, je suis allé, euh, à un moment donné, je suis allé vers la bibliothèque. Je me suis dit, bon, bah, je vais aller... Euh... J'ai hésité à un moment, je me suis dit, où est-ce qu'il faut que j'aille Donc j'ai commencé à aller vers la bibliothèque, je l'ai remarqué. Je me suis dit, non, c'est une mauvaise idée, je suis tout seul. Je suis allé dans un café au centre-ville, en fait. Moi, j'ai été investi depuis euh, plusieurs mois sur, le, euh, sur les processus d'organisation de la COP21. Donc, euh, en gros, c'était toutes les, toutes les questions logistiques. Et, euh, et moi, j'étais un peu dans la, dans la commission juridique de soutien aux manifestants. Donc, c'est des dispositifs quand il y a des grandes manifestations qui sont mis en place pour euh, faire le suivi juridique des manifestants, en fait. Et à partir du 13 novembre et la déclaration de l'état d'urgence, euh, nous, notre premier réflexe a été... Un, de se dire, ça va être vraiment très compliqué, la COP21. Deux, de se dire, mince, qu'est-ce qu'ils vont pouvoir utiliser contre les militants Parce que déjà, le 20 novembre, on s'est posé la question très sérieusement de quel dispositif, et on s'est plongé tout de suite dans la loi d'état d'urgence pour savoir quel dispositif pouvait être utilisé dans le cadre de l'état d'urgence contre les mobilisations de la COP21. Et euh, bah, l'histoire nous a donné raison. Et ça, ça a mis une pression extraordinaire sur l'ensemble des dynamiques, puisque c'était censé être une mobilisation internationale où étaient attendues des dizaines de milliers de personnes, voire des centaines de milliers, si... parce que c'était plutôt sur ça que tablaient les grandes organisations telles que Havas ou, ou autres, qui, mobilis... qui le 29 novembre voulaient ramener plusieurs centaines de milliers de personnes à... dans la rue. Quand nous voyons des activistes de Occupy Wall Street, being surveilled with the very same tools of mass surveillance. When we see that activists in the US because they're Muslim are being surveilled. When we see in France that state of emergency is used against uh, uh, ecology activists and all kinds of activism, we have a demonstration that anti-terrorism as a way of governance only leads to injustice, only leads to undue use, abuse of power. So you understand why the state wants to send examples, right? They don't, they don't have to have entire, pop, you know, entire segments of the population being obviously outed, outed, right? They just have to keep track of them. You know, and those that are a bit more, um, <laughs> let's say, expressing, expressing themselves Uh, let's say a bit more questioning about authority, well, they're the ones we're going to pay a little bit more attention to, especially if they organize, especially if they associate. La note blanche, c'est euh, toutes les petites notes cumulées que les gens, euh, les agents de renseignement prennent sur le terrain. Euh, par exemple, là, je vois euh, animateur, animateur du camp de Bure. Donc effectivement, pendant dix jours, il y a eu un camp organiser un village, organisé euh, à Bure, euh, dans l'est de la France, contre un projet d'enfouissement de déchets nucléaires. Donc ça rassemblait euh, 800 personnes par jour, et c'était en lien avec les associations locales, ça a été construit avec les habitants du coin, ça a été construit avec énormément de monde. Donc de ne retenir que il y a eu des actions, de le superposer à « il a animé des réunions », c'est comme si j'avais organisé ces actions en fait. On met ça dans la note blanche, 
je participe à, euh, à la mobilisation, je fais partie du collectif de soutien à, à, à la lutte de Notre-Dame-des-Landes contre la construction d'un aéroport à Nantes. On avait organisé juste un petit rassemblement spontané à la station Notre-Dame-des-Champs à Paris. Et ça, c'est faisceau d'indices concordants. On n'a pas de fait, on n'a rien, pas d'accusation. Et pour cause, j'ai un casier judiciaire vierge, il euh, n'y a pas de fait en fait. Ça montre vraiment qu'à la fin, on construit une figure de l'ennemi intérieur, de, 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 de la personne qui va menacer les institutions de l'État. Et c'est ce qui se retrouve à la fin, quand, quand c'est écrit que l'intéressé participe activement depuis plusieurs années aux actions menées contre les représentations de l'État. Voilà. Et à la fin, on a ça. Et cette, cette feuille-là, quand c'est un juge, il, il a ça, et ben il part du principe que qui est là, c'est suffisamment euh, convaincant pour qu'on ne remette pas en cause la version officielle, en fait. Do we really want a preemptive crime society where if I decide you might be? I mean, this is what's happening. This is where if you get this much information, the temptation of a, of a, of a secret power to abuse it, where you turn your own people inside out, because you have the power to do so. And that, that is pathological. This is a pathological condition. It goes far beyond actual threats. It goes far, you have threats, right? Because that's to justify the need for all of this security apparatus. But you're ultimately using it for social control. I think any uh, state which does surveillance is uh, essentially to make sure The, the, the state power will not be um, endangered by the people. They want to keep the power. So they want to know what people are doing, what they are, with whom they have relationships, so that they, they can, if necessary, block the people they think are part of the political antagonism. We've redefined what privacy is. No reasonable expectation of privacy. Wow, redefine privacy so you define it away in a way that actually suits the interests of national security. Whoa, remember that thing? Nothing to fear, nothing to hide. Then why, if you're so fearful, are you that fearful of the people? I mean, I can reverse all of this. I can reverse it and say, they must be incredibly fearful of the people. They may not say it that way, but then why would you need all these records just in case? Ich bin persönlich von Überwachung betroffen gewesen, weil mein Freund André Holm seit 2006 beschuldigt wurde, Terrorist zu sein. André ist Soziologe und beschäftigt sich mit dem Thema Gentrifizierung in Berlin sehr viel, schon seit vielen Jahren und hat viele Texte veröffentlicht als Wissenschaftler, auch als Aktivist, weil er sich für Mieter und Mieterinnen in Berlin einsetzt. Das BKA hat zu dieser Zeit nach einer äh, militanten Gruppe gesucht und weil sie die nicht gefunden haben, haben sie irgendwann die Texte unter anderem von André mit deren Texten verglichen und haben dann ähnliche Worte gefunden. Ich glaube sieben Worte, die in deren Texten und in seinen Texten vorkamen, Gentrifizierung, Reproduktion, auch marxistisch-leninistisch, was für Wissenschaftler eine Vokabel ist, die nicht ungewöhnlich ist. Und das war der Anfangsverdacht, warum sie dann gedacht haben, es könnte sein, dass der die Texte dieser Gruppe schreibt und haben angefangen, ihn zu überwachen. And this is where mass surveillance shows its true face of an instrument of social control. This is the main purpose, the main effect of mass surveillance, is to keep populations under the diffuse impression that if they say something, or if they do something that may make them look like they have something to hide, that may be something worth hiding, then people will know about it, so they better not say it and not do it. This is how it works in every authoritarian regime since the, 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 the dawn of times. I think this is, this is something that comes back to who we are as people. I just know from history, I know from my own experience, I know from even dark chapters in U.S. history that the power of the state 
through instruments like surveillance, ultimately turn against the people. And it's not far removed, right? It's not far removed to take that kind of power and now establish something that's clearly undemocratic. And you begin, you, you in essence, are treating all of your people as subjects, right? Not citizens. This myth of nothing to hide, when put into action, may turn individuals into perfect subjects of control, into subjects who accept control, who accept dominance, who accept uh, servitude. Remember, even in 1984, I mean, that, that's a novel that has become very real for me. Or even in Brave New World, which is another way of looking at this, okay? Sort of the, you know, the bread and circuses routine, right? Um, here's the problem. If, if I say I have nothing to hide, I'm going to come back to that because I have people in my network right now that will actually say that knowing full well what they say. Then where does it end? Because if you say in terms of electronic communications, I have no reasonable expectation of privacy, then where do I have an expectation of privacy? After the first time uh, we met, uh, around uh, five weeks uh, passed. And uh, in this time, we performed a sort of uh, unprofessional stalking of uh, a subject we call uh, Mr. X. So we only looked at the metadata. That meant we didn't touch the content of your Facebook messages and so on. We only considered data about data. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you talk on the phone, metadata is how long does a call last, who's calling, who and the reason we only looked at metadata is because that's really what governments admit to doing in terms of surveillance. And people think it's not that bad, it's just metadata. It's not actually the content of my email, it's just who I send it to that can't be that bad. But the thing is, of course, if um, you correlate data, you have metadata from different sources, you get a storyline, and maybe the content isn't even that important anymore. So at the beginning, we just start to address uh, where the subject moves, to figure it out uh, in the space uh, where uh, you are. This is, for example, the first week, no? Between the um, 23 and 27 of March. And we see that uh, you spend some time in uh, Berlin and then uh, in uh, Hamburg. In the third week, we saw that you were basically in uh, Berlin only. And uh, we are seeing a different visualization. It's called the cluster, and uh, this permits us to see um, which is the location where you are more often. That is necessary to understand you are living in this street, Wartstrasse, near Tempelhof. In the fourth week, we are seeing a different visualization. Most of the time uh, uh, you were in Berlin, sometimes uh, in the north uh, east to do sport, sometimes when you were running around the Tempelhof airport, but most of the time you see the color, the darker color show where you were more frequent frequently. So your place, uh, the bar is in front of uh, your house uh, and some friend of you uh, near Gorlitzer Park. In the last week, we see in fact that uh, you went uh, in uh, Leipzig again. And also you move in Luxembourg, where you dis when uh, we discover that uh, you are in fact born. Analyzing uh, the URL you are connecting, we saw at first who you are and uh, which is your Facebook profile. And then uh, we find another um, secondary event. What uh, was attracting me was this spike. This is the most uh, um, high frequency usage of uh, web you have done during this month. Why, I wonder. That was the point. 27 to 28 of March, I get hired one episode in which you were performing in Tatort. The reason of the spike of the uh, navigation is that uh, you were uh, quite uh, concerned on uh, the critics and the reaction. Of the, of the person. So mostly you are checking uh, if everything uh, went good, uh, 
if your performance uh, has been appreciated by the audience, a spike of Facebook message appears of person that normally don't talk with you. So probably they were just uh, telling, uh, congratulations, uh, I saw you, well done, Max. And this is the same kind of uh, anomaly that uh, happened during the birthday, when person that uh, normally aren't in touch with you, but for that day, they arrive. We saw that uh, uh, you were quite active all the night, until uh, 6 a.m. at least, maybe with a couple of uh, uh, hours of stop. Another way to see any wave metadata is just to synthesize and take some very peculiar uh, moment of the day. For example, where you were between the 4 a.m. and the 5 a.m. So, where did you see last night? Uh, mostly we see that uh, are two days where uh, you are in, uh, in the towers. And if we unzoom the map at European level, we saw clearly the um, Hamburg and Leipzig where you were for um, a couple of special events. Okay, so here's a quick overview of the data that we collected from you. You can see that it varies per day. We get a lot of location coordinates. Um, so we did an analysis of what domains or what websites you visit when you serve the web. And that huge blue bar on the left that you see there is Facebook. Um, so a lot of your web activity is concentrated there. You also go to some other websites like you research, travel, you Google some things, of course. You order food, you watch a lot of online videos, you watch some porn, you're interested in synthesizers, but still Facebook is like the thing for you. What's always really interesting is to look at people's Google searches because usually you can learn quite a lot about what goes on in people's minds by looking at their Google searches. You did 83 Google searches in one month. And that yeah. seemed like not a lot to me. No. I did some research, I found that the average person apparently does 150 a month. Really? That's not much of Google searches though. No. That's funny, yeah. Just to know, all the websites you navigated, uh, for the 72% of the time, they include Facebook. What does it mean? When you are connecting yourself to a website, you feel that you are just doing a connection to a single host, and only one entity, one organization knows about your activity. In fact, uh, there are other third party. There are many, at least uh, between five to 20, depends on the kind of website. But in this case, uh, the two most, most, most frequent are normally Facebook and Google. And Facebook uh, uh, was um, clearly aware of what you were doing, also uh, if you were not in Facebook. Uh, we made this analysis mostly by hand because it's not our job. Once we've developed this tool, means that the next person we have the data, we can create this, the same kind of output. So we have to think that most of the time the enemy, that can be a government or a corporate surveillance, when they develop the tool, that is for one person or for one billion is the same. I mean, I mean, I give you an example, my own example. I keep saying, what is it like? It's not a very good feeling when you get up every morning knowing that your own government is tracking you. They told me later, we knew everywhere, we knew when you got up, we knew when you left the house. We knew which vehicles you used, where you stopped, where you shopped. Every electronic communication that they had access to was being monitored on a 24-7 basis, including my phone. Where do you go in that regime? Where do you go? I, I can get emotional. It's, I, I mean, I, where do you go? Where, where's a safe place? Where do you go to be yourself, right? Nature. 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 But Alan, you have to do a cup sprung, Ruf. Come on, you're driven.
are, are we we're back down to just the fit my physical body just the literally the only the only thing left now is in my head this private and even that's suspect with emerging technology so where do i go that's safe where's the safe room i get back to 1984 winston cowered in the corner why? Because it was the only place where the, the surveillance cameras couldn't see him, which meant they knew where he was. And in the end, people forget the rest of the book. They haven't read, people have finished reading 1984. It's quite dystopian because even Winston gives up. Winston is the protagonist. Winston is the person in all of this, right? What happens to Winston is what happens to society. Also die allermeisten inoffiziellen Mitarbeiter, die lange für die Stasi gearbeitet haben, und das ist die Mehrzahl, die hat das freiwillig gemacht. Zum Teil haben sie ein bisschen Geld gekriegt, ja, zum Teil ein paar kleinere Geschenke. Aber ich, ich glaube, die Hauptsache war dieses Machtgefühl, was die hatten. Aber es war äh, der Mann, der Bruder... Ja, der Vater, der Sohn und so weiter, die ganze Palette. Naja, das hat ja, glaube ich, gesagt, ja, in meinem Fall war es mein Mann. Und ähm, der hat aber dann äh, später gesagt, er hätte das gemacht, weil er Angst hatte, dass ich verhaftet werden könnte. Und dass, wenn er mit der Stasi zusammenarbeitet, er das erfahren würde dass ich verhaftet werde oder werden soll und mich dann davor schützen kann. Und ich glaube ihm das auch, weil, äh, als ich zu dieser Demonstration gehen wollte, bei der ich dann verhaftet wurde, er hat alles versucht, mich davon abzuhalten, außer zu sagen, du, ich weiß es von meinem Führungsoffizier, dass du verhaftet werden sollst, also bleib hier. Das hat er nicht gemacht. Ja. C'est ça en fait le fond de la chose, c'est que beaucoup de gens se disent non mais il a sans doute cherché, il y a sans doute une bonne raison. Ils font pas ça sans rien, ils le surveillent pas sans rien. Il y a plusieurs personnes qui m'ont dit mais attends si t'as été assigné c'est quand même que tu fais quand même des choses quoi. Enfin t'as as bien dû jeter des machins ou t'as bien dû faire quelque chose. Et quand il y a une prise de conscience que c'est pas le cas, c'est là que la plupart des gens se disent ah merde euh, je pourrais être surveillé, je pourrais avoir des problèmes aussi. Et c'est ce qui s'est passé pour ma famille et pas mal de gens de mon entourage qui me connaissent, qui savent qui je suis et qui eux ont violemment pris conscience de ce que voulait dire la surveillance et de ce que ça pouvait entraîner comme conséquence en fait. Pour moi c'était un peu euh, difficile parce que euh, je savais que Joël était surveillé et puis cette surveillance euh, donc euh, quand on ne sait pas pas, on le sait pas, mais dès qu'on commence à s'en douter et qu'on en est sûr, bah c'est une intrusion dans l'intimité qui est quand même très euh, violente et enfin euh, moi je l'ai vraiment vécu comme une violation de mon intimité. Et moi ça m'a mis vraiment, euh, je pense, une bonne semaine hein, à me dire euh, allez, euh, faut que la vie elle continue et il faut pas rester dans cette euh, paranoïa et cet état de euh, psychose et euh, post-traumatique, ouais, vraiment. Euh... Et donc. Euh, la plupart des gens se pensent à l'abri de ça, mais il suffit que la police se trompe de porte lors d'une perquisition administrative sous état d'urgence, qu'un voisin mal intentionné ou un collègue mal intentionné dit euh, « lui, je, je, il est louche, ça, il s'est rasé la barbe, il va à la mosquée », et on peut très vite tomber dans cette case de la personne surveillée en fait. Et euh, d'avoir le sentiment qu'on est à l'abri de ça parce qu'on n'a rien à se reprocher, euh... Eh ben, c'est vraiment, c'est vraiment le là où s'articule la, la force de la surveillance en fait. C'est qu'elle isole les personnes en fait. Elle isole l'individu, le bon individu du mauvais individu. Das fand ich persönlich furchtbar. Das war wahnsinnig unangenehm. Faktisch zu wissen, hier in meinem Leben jetzt findet das statt. Dieses Telefon wird abgehört. Es gab Observationen auf der Straße, also zivile Beamte, die unsere Wohnung beobachtet haben oder uns hinterhergelaufen sind. Es hat auch Kameras gegeben, das wissen wir aus den Akten, die auf unsere Hauseingangstür gerichtet waren und auf den Hinterhof. 
Andres Eltern, die phasenweise auch mit überwacht worden sind, weil unterstellt wurde, dass selbst die in dieser terroristischen Geschichte mit drin stecken. Wir wissen von BKA-Überwachung von 2006 bis 2010, also vier Jahre. Ob die vorher überwacht haben oder uns jetzt noch beobachten, wissen wir nicht. Wobei ich auch in Akten später gesehen habe, dass äh, auch meine öffentlichen Veranstaltungen, wenn ich über dieses Verfahren berichtet habe und über die Überwachung berichtet habe, dass auch das vom Verfassungsschutz beobachtet wurde damals. Und das kann ja sein, dass das bis heute stattfindet. Aber ich bin Jahre später irgendwann mal in den USA gewesen und kann mich sehr deutlich an das Gefühl erinnern, in diesem Hotel auf dem Bett zu sitzen und zu denken, jetzt sind sie wahrscheinlich nicht da. Und das war ein unglaublich befreiendes Gefühl, plötzlich das erste Mal das Gefühl zu haben, ich bin alleine. The feeling of not being able to conduct my work or my personal life uh, without prying eyes and ears felt like It felt like a, an injustice, a, an, an invasion. Um, there are levels in which it affects you also emotionally. Um, you know, in 2013, uh, my mother, you know, was given a, a diagnosis of a terminal illness. And, um, you know, some of the most important conversations of anyone's life, uh, certainly my life, um, took place, you know, as my mother was actually on her deathbed. And, you know, after, after these feelings of, um, you know, just total invasion, I wasn't able to uh, sort of just connect with this experience of taking care of my mother without doing something about, you know, the mobile phones that are constantly in the room. Um, so, you know, maybe strange to say, but it offered me some little bit of comfort um, while taking care of my mother to put the phones in the other room. And literally when she was, you know, sharing with me some of the, you know, the last things that she wanted to say to me, um, I had to go put the phones in the freezer. And, you know, maybe that sounds nuts to a lot of people, <laughs> but, you know, it's <laughs> mass surveillance, you know, comes home. It's not just something that happens over there or to, you know, NSA contractors. <laughs> uh, it's not just something that, you know, famous, um, famous people talk about um, or journalists are concerned about. Um, it can touch, touch the lives of people who think of themselves as regular people. What, what makes, can make a bit afraid is really like this dislocation things like i mean this this weekend where i was in hamburg that's really weird like yeah. to, to see to see like i was this dot at that point you are clubbing here yeah yeah Th those are things that that is really really personal stuff you know where you don't do you don't want to share it with someone i have kind of a conclusion of course yeah, working was... on your data for hours you start yeah. to think about you know who is that per person what are they doing and from what i learned about you what i saw about you i guess that's that's kind of the image i arrived at that you're like an active social person who's definitely not nerdy there's nothing about politics for example on there so i have no yeah. idea <clears throat> if you care about politics and if you care about politics like what your views are That's crazy. But did you see that I'm I'm a wealthy person on, on how I how I interact or we can guess from uh, the social graph. So we don't know the person, but we assume that if you're in touch with a, a famous actor, implicitly you belong to a certain kind of social mm -hmm. circle. Uh, if uh, your provenance is uh, um, a person that speaks three language, uh, came from one of the healthiest places uh, in uh, Europe, again, is another probability, another high, high chance that maybe you belong to a certain kind of uh, social status. And then it, it plays a role in terms of, for example, credit rating. You might, insurance might become more expensive for you, or products at the extreme end might become more or less expensive for you, depending on how much money you have and how much you want them. Because we, we can kind of see what you do and what you need. If you have the indicator of uh, don't sleep for two days in a row, or to be um, in the point A to the point B in less than this uh, uh, amount of time, uh, that means uh, you are going fast with your car, are things that uh, somehow 
discriminate you. Yeah, I feel that is really unfair. And Facebook addict, yeah, it, <laughs> it seems really weird because I, I don't post that much, you know. I don't go like stalking people. And I, it's more like to do. Well, yeah, to, to advertise, like, my job. I was using uh, when you connect us Facebook the first time uh, to understand that when you wake up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess most of the people do that. I don't know. I do it like this. It's weird. <laughs> you have to think that uh, um, the app we are installing in uh, our mobile phone most of the time have access to some of the metadata we use. It. And you don't know exactly who is behind. We promised to you that we are not going to uh, make any harm uh, yeah. uh, with, with your data. But uh, when your data are collected by uh, 20 or more uh, anonymous company in the other side of the ocean, and uh, you for them are just a number, that is the uh, scary aspect of the uh, corporate surveillance. They pull in all the metadata of your, uh, your transactions, and then they can do timelines of your entire relationship uh, in the community that you have and the transactions over time in sequence and build basically a timeline of your electronic life. It's all done automatically with software. It doesn't take people to do it. They call it the corporate store, sort of in quotes, the corporate store. It started off with just phone numbers, which obviously can be indexed to names and addresses. And then it turned into emails, financial information, internet usage. Well, what they're primarily interested in is who are you hanging out with and what are you saying? Who are you spending time with? This is where the metadata actually is quite significant. My, my view on it has changed, changed a lot though, because I, I saw exactly like what is possible and how far you can really go. It's hard to see it in front of your eyes, like all this, all this stuff, all this data. And that someone, someone talking about you, like that you never met before. Um, stuff like that, that was really weird. The most shocking was, for me, it was to see in the cinema like all these names appearing all over the place, like on my contacts of, of my phone, of my Facebook, ranked like in different kind of actors, directors, friends, maybe friends, we don't know, maybe lovers, yeah, all this. And even they had a weird feeling because a lot of people came back and were really asking like, oh, what, how is the surveillance going and, and the movie and thing? Because I guess that's something that that was something really really weird for them to hear from me that I'm next to them and I get surveilled like the whole time, you know, for close friends or whatever. Like they were like, "This is pretty." Mm. These questions they came always back, like these questions of, uh, "Was it really a good idea to do it?" and "Do I really want to show my behavior on my phone or on my internet?" and everything. And I think it changed a bit, maybe, um, my behavior in that time, but I could not say really how. It was just a bit weird that I really saw that there were that less information, considering like uh, Google searches, uh, for example, you know. And those are things that, that were a bit like, hey, so what, what did I do actually this seven months? If you look down through history, I mean, the cases, uh, most recent ones, are the Soviet Union and the East, in East Germany. If you looked at uh, the surveillance states that they had and how that worked was people became very uh, uh, sensitive to being watched and monitored, and they were afraid to do anything unique or different that is be, to be uh, uh, adventuresome to take a risk, right? That destroys that sense of uh, the freedom to do that when you're being monitored. And so what that does is it stagnates the society. I mean, the society doesn't advance because there's no creativity and innovation. This is an impact on society that's huge, especially in a free society where we should be able to say what we want to say, especially in a private setting. Um, and that's something that is oftentimes kind of done away with when they ask, you know, what's actually the damage? What's the problem? What's like your direct effect? 
what where is the dead body in a way if you don't have privacy and we oftentimes don't have a dead body we just have a body that doesn't move too much anymore if you if your legend if you have is you have nothing to hide if you try to make yourself believe you have nothing to hide then you will speak like if you have nothing to hide then there are things you won't say there are things you won't do there might be people you won't meet and this is all we lose collectively as a society It's probably the first time in history um, that technology is um, allowing the possibility to have a real mass surveillance, again from public or private actors. And as you said, this surveillance is rather accepted by the person. So the question that we have collectively to ask ourselves is, is it exactly the type of digital environment we want? And I think we're right at this moment now. I have my answer, but uh, I think all of us, we should ask ourselves this question uh, because um, the choices won't be exactly the same, you see. The things we should not do are thinking that there's nothing we can do about it and we lost already. What we can do is to convince each and every one that it's not a lost battle and that it is worth fighting to start with. Es gibt keine unwichtigen Informationen und jede Information kann missbraucht werden, wenn es jemand missbrauchen will. Und ich sage den Schülern immer, ihr müsst aufpassen, was ihr von euch preisgebt. Denn äh, so schön diese neuen Möglichkeiten alle sind, aber äh, die beinhalten auch eine Überwachung äh, der heutigen Menschen, von denen die Stasi nur träumen konnte. I think another thing people can start to do is also play around with just kind of feeling like they understand how the technology works a bit more. You know, using a computer or a mobile phone, we've been taught that it's a bit like a washing machine. You know, you put stuff in, you press the program, and then you don't think about how it works. The truth is, is the less you know, the less control you have over what's happening. So, like, motivating people to get a bit more interested in knowing how the internet works, or knowing how your device works, or knowing why it is that the company's giving you free services is pretty important. There are a lot of things you have to learn. No? Uh, if you want to fly, you have to take courses in flying. If you want to run, you have to train yourself in running. <laughs> and uh, I believe the, the, the best way is the community, community learning by other people, which makes it more, more convincing and also more, uh, more understandable so very often. There is, for pretty much everything that you're using now, every Microsoft or Apple product or Google or Facebook or whatever, there is probably an alternative and in most cases the alternative is very good and you know just really simple things like using a search engine that doesn't track you like disconnect or DuckDuckGo because we know that Google is a very powerful surveillance engine you know in all these great you know really sophisticated tools that it gives us it's taking all of our data um, signal for texting is, is something that I teach Tor browser that is the web browser that helps protect some of your personally identifiable information from uh, websites you visit, from your internet service provider, from anyone who's observing your network traffic, whether they are, you know, your, you know, work IT department or a sovereign state. I think we have to be very humble here. We have to, to, to think very carefully how we speak about those things. A saying to someone in a, in a, in a, saying to someone living in an authoritarian regime where internet communications are particularly surveilled, oh, you should use Tor may end up having this person taken to jail or worse. Because in some countries, maybe just using Tor blinks a red light, ar, 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 potential political open and detected. So it's not about giving advice. It is about sharing and understanding. And it is also about uh, building collective resources where we can efficiently mutualize knowledge. So on a case by case basis, we can find appropriate solutions. The good part is that 
once we arrive to a world where half of the population will encrypt for no reason, it will help others by overwhelming the Soviet state with uninteresting encrypted mails. But we need this hype to start and begin for all of us to be really secure. We need free, liberal software. Software that belongs to the humanity as a whole. Software where everybody on Earth has the same freedom as the author to get to understand what a piece of software does and to get to modify it. Then we need decentralized services. A decentralized services means that you know where your data goes. You know what is happening when you click somewhere. You know what is stored, you know where it's stored. So we need all this in conjunction with end-to-end -end encryption, not any form of encryption. End-to-end -end encryption means that you generate a cryptographic key, I generate a cryptographic key. We decide to share those keys, and then we are in control. What I like about the tech side is that there is something that can be done. We can, each of us, can make a change to our behavior um, in terms of whether we encrypt our communications, whether we use free software, um, hopefully some combination of all these ideals, um, and you know, even just making one small change today does do a great deal. You know, just using an encrypted texting app like Signal for your communications between your friends is not perfect. Phones are bad, you know, all these other issues, um, but it's something. And I think it shows people that they are empowered to make a change themselves. And it means also that democracy, people have got to understand, democracy is not a spectator sport. You have to be, participate, you have to be active, and you have to do that continuously to ensure that you keep your rights and freedoms. You can do access requests, you can ask any company in the world what data are you storing about me. They have to send you a copy of everything they hold about you. Do you have an idea of what they're actually holding about you? You can see, oh, they shouldn't have this information, where did they get it from? And um, this creates a lot of trouble, in interestingly, for companies. If just individual people asking, what are you actually having on me and why do you have that and how is this legal? It gets the whole legal department going crazy. It's an industrial challenge that would take policymakers on the path of really doing shit for growth and jobs if this is really what they care about. Building, rebuilding the capacity in Europe, in Germany, in France and everywhere to, to build computer chips, to build computer systems we can understand on a hardware base is something critical. When we realize that there's something we can do on a personal and community level, I think it can encourage us to act um, at the political level more. So by contacting our lawmakers or supporting organizations that are doing the work of law reform. Um, one of the most powerful things that I think has happened since Snowden is this massive increase of all of those things. All the people who are working on this stuff, more or less in isolation, have come together in a way that is I think um, when I think that we're going to win, I think it's because of that kind of solidarity that we have. Ich geb den meinen. 
Beine Die klauen meine Er greift nach dir, der Megadata Warum im Netz versteckt Metadata Sturm Er greift nach dir, der Megadata Warum im Netz versteckt Metadata Sturm Called you quite a lot. You're not always very good about at picking up when she calls. <laughs> <laughs> you actually did the calculation. You're 30% less likely to answer your phone when your mom calls than when anybody else calls. <laughs> But you, you're good. You always call her back in the end. I'm gonna call her back always. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 